Uh, yeah. Let's let let's uh, let's well let's introduce you for people who don't know uh, who they're looking at here. Uh, Larry Studnicki from High Plains Drifters. I uh, self-titled debut in 2019 did very well, but you had a Christmas hit with Santa Bring My Girlfriend Back uh, this past Christmas. Big hit on radio, uh, did really well, and you got a new single and part of a new album i'm hoping uh since you've been gone which is very different for for the band and uh the band is a genre bending band uh a lot of different influences coming up but this is something really new uh larry you got to tell me about <laughs> the how how this one came up since you've been gone is uh you know a modern dance pop thing right first first i want to thank you for having me and for saying such nice things about our little unknown band we we were really lucky with the uh santa bring my girlfriend backtrack it did way better than i think anyone maybe not anyone but certainly way better than those of us in the band expected it to do even though we we thought it was a special song yeah, it was a lot uh, of fun it was so much fun to listen to right yeah, I mean, it was we 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 knew when we were when we recorded it back in August, and and we left with a rough mix that day. We thought we had something really special as Christmas songs go. It was a it, the band did it in about five takes. Uh, everybody was on. It was just really fun and and you know, like Christmas magic from day one. But let's let's talk about the new single since you've been gone. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely you're absolutely right that it's the. Uh, it, it is the announcement that there's a second album coming. We're six songs into it, meaning six, six songs are almost completely finished, mixed, et cetera. Nice. And then we'll have, we have six more in, in various forms of being demoed. Uh, Since You've Been Gone isn't, for us in the band, it's not entirely the departure that it may sound like from album one, because we, at the end of album one, we, started to uh, on one song we started to move a, in a little more modern a little more of a pop direction uh but that song was sonically so different than the rest of album one that we kept it off the record it's called he reminds me of you and you'll hear it on album two and it won't sound so odd up against since you've been gone um okay. we've been trying to find a way to marry, I guess what you'd call my classic kind of 70s storyteller approach to songwriting mm -hmm. with a lot of the musical influences that most of us in the band have carried through our lives from, let's say, the 80s. Um, and so you hear things on Since You've Been Gone. I call it uh, the Eagles Meet New Order. That's kind of my yeah. mashup. I read that it. and it was so accurate. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it really is. I, I think it, yeah. I mean, it, it came to me when I it, it, it hit me when I heard when I heard the first really close to final mix of the single. I immediately wrote to our producer Greg Cohen and I said, it's the Eagles Meet New Order. And and it's even that's more true than than you might think. You haven't heard the there's a ballad version of Since You've Been Gone, which we recorded, which I don't want to flatter us, but it could be an Eagles tune. I mean, it, I, I'm heavily influenced by 70s soft rock and Southern rock and, and all the classic rock that was still going on. But there are definite undertones of Eagles type writing in, in some of what I do and in the way the band approaches some of the songs. You can hear some of that on the debut album. So there's an album version of the song, which could have been an Eagles ballad. But we wanted the first single to be something a little more up tempo. And oddly, when I first sat down with Greg Cohen, our producer on the song, I had always heard the song in my head as a little more up tempo and a little more rock, more rock than the Eagles would have been. And Greg wanted to try it as a ballad. We did the ballad and then we all sat back and went, that's a great ballad, but now let's do something a little more modern and up tempo that brings in the kind of eighties influences that we're uh, that are, you're probably going to hear on not not maybe everything on this album, but uh, you'll hear a fair amount of uh, '80s influences throughout this record, more so than on the first record. Wow, that's yeah, and that's that'll be quite a bit different. 
uh, than the first record. I don't hear too much 80s on the first record. Uh, you know, it's much more uh, 70s rock, um, not folk. Uh, it's, it's, you know, that's the one thing about the High Plains Drifters record. It's, you can't box it really. Well, that's both good and bad. Well, <laughs> um, it's true. It, 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 um, <laughs> We, we've we've really taken to this label. I forget who gave it to us on the first album, but we love the genre bending label. And all of us, I mean, we're all older guys. And we yes, we've had a lot of influences and inspirations in our lives. And, you know, some of my favorite uh, bands or songwriters are, are guys and groups that have kind of pushed the envelope a little on genres. Um, I, I always say, you know, go go listen to to the great Marshall Tucker songs like uh, Can't You See or yeah. Heard It in a Love Song. And then go listen to the Style Council from the UK, Paul Weller's right. second right. band after the jam, who are one of my favorite 80s bands of all times and totally different kinds of songs. And yet the instrumentation on those guys, it, it's not so different. Right. Listen, listen to. Listen to Can't You See, then go listen to some of the great works by the Style Council. There are a lot, a lot of great musicians playing a lot of different instruments, uh, not purely rock, not purely pop. You've got strings, you've got horns, you've got guitars, sure. keyboards. And, you know, you, you, you tell me, what would you call, you know, the Style Council? What are they? They're not... They're not rock. They're not quite pop. Marshall yeah. Tucker, a Southern rock band, but much more than that, you know? Yes, yes, definitely. And, you know, I've always uh, associated like Style Council with New Wave, uh, just because that's, you know, coming up in the 80s like that. That was a... Yeah, and because, and, and because, and because, because, I mean, Paul Weller was one of the, you know, leading lights of the yeah. New Wave in the jam, so... Yeah. But he completely, it's almost like he walked away. He walked away from that for most of the 80s, then came back to it when he went solo in the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not, you know, it's not your typical 80s new wave. You know, it's really, oh. you know, it's, there's, there's a lot more. Yeah. There's a, it's a musical we're, potpourri, you know? Yeah. And I, I don't, we're, we're not trying, we're not trying to be all over the map, but, but we want to, we have more fun and I think the songs are more fun to listen to when they kind of evoke more than just one style. You know, we could have done, and again, you listen, when you hear it on the album, the ballad version of Since You've Been Gone is a gorgeous classic rock ballad. I don't know that it would get a lot of radio play. I'd hope it might end up in a soundtrack or two somewhere, but um, I, I spent the 80s single working hard and then out in the clubs late at night and you know groups like new order and a lot of the other somewhat they're not dance bands but yeah they right. have a little bit every now and then a little bit more of a dance groove to some of their stuff and yeah. and that that stuff's like i mean through the haze of alcohol and everything else it's somehow <laughs> embedded itself somehow embedded itself in my brain you know <laughs> well yeah there is a, a distinct difference between that keyboard driven kind of pop depeche mode kind of uh new wave thing than there is you know with a duran duran or a new um uh fix kind of thing yep. tends to be a little more guitar bass driven uh whereas depeche mode and that kind of thing is a keyboard ish kind of it, it transcends a little bit because it's I, I hear that more now with the keyboard yeah. in in the well, you'll and you'll probably you're gonna hear i think you'll hear a couple of tunes on this second album that are going to be a little more rooted in in keys there's a there's a one of the ideas that i had for just for what's now just a handful of songs was that i thought it'd be cool to revisit some of the famous girls that other guys famously sang about in the past so i had an idea for a song michelle well essentially uh tip of the hat to paul mccartney's michelle that he did with the beatles and that's a very i i heard it in my head almost entirely as a, a keyboard based uh track and so far on the demo there's almost nothing but uh but the percussion track and the keys that i hear um whereas then there's another 
track uh, triggered this past summer when Kenny Rogers passed, uh, who uh, yeah. you know, did the great Mel Tillis song, uh, Ruby, Don't Take Your Love to Town. And it, it triggered in me an idea. I was like, okay, let's go see what Ruby's doing 30, 40 years later. Oh, that's and cool. I, ended up, I ended up writing a song over the course of August called Ruby Run Away With Me. Um, no keyboards on that. Um, and very much a guitar driven song, but, but it, you're going to hear, uh, not a classic rock guitar driven song, more of an eighties type guitar driven song. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, speaking of, of names on the debut, you have Jennifer Aniston, of course, uh, who just had her birthday and I missed it. <laughs> I didn't realize, <laughs> I didn't realize it was her birthday just this past week. Yes. Tip, happy birthday, Jennifer. Larry's a big Jennifer Aniston fan. <laughs> just listen I, I to the song. You can tell. <laughs> well, it, 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 it's true. It, that's true, but it's for a good reason. Um, uh, I, I worked with a, a guy years ago who's one of the top uh, music lawyers in LA right now. I'm not going to name names, mm -hmm. but um, I, this is before TiVo and the DVR and, you know, cloud-based recording and everything. So we're talking back in the nineties when friends was first was on the air and on Thursdays, he had to run home to watch a TV show. It's like, what are you doing? He's like, I got to get home in time to watch friends. <laughs> I was like, I was like, why? What is this? You know, like, we have, we have work to do, man. We have work to do. Um, he had to get home to see friends. So I, I started watching it on and off, uh, fell in love with the writing and the actors and everything about it. When COVID hit, when COVID hit and no one knew what was going on and we all locked our, literally locked ourselves in for like those first 60 or 90 days, we tried to figure out what can we as a family, there are three of us, my daughter had just turned 13 what can we watch binge watch that'll go for a long long time and that our daughter is arguably of an age where it might educate her a little and i th i thought she might get into friends so we threw it on and she fell in love with it from the first episode and i realized watching that that first season that you know when you watch it from the beginning to the end you realize that you know the writers were on their game from day one oh, i mean yeah. You know, there, there's not a bad script in the 10 or 11 years and you watch them. They're all they're all great actors and actresses. But I, I really think Aniston has something as a comedian in her, her timing and everything else that makes her one of the great comedic actresses of, of, of the last 40, 50 years. Yeah, so. that's cool. That's cool. And, it, and it's a great song and it's a great video. Uh <laughs> It is a great it is a great video. I, I know you're not you're not a. Uh, are you on your streaming? Are you able to play the videos when you stream? I, I can, yeah. Play the video for people at some point. It's worth it. Right. Yeah. Oh, it is. It's fantastic. I mean, it's really, really great. Uh, <laughs> you know, and and I thought, you know, your background is, of course, Harvard Law. You're you've been in law for. I've been in law. I've been I've been a lawyer forever. Yeah, <laughs> whole a lifetime. Uh, yeah. And I look at that and I think, hmm, <laughs> that has to be a bordering on that. <laughs> you know, you have well, to know what you can and can't say, what you can and can't show. Uh, the video well, really actually right. We, uh, when, you, when you see the video, I had one of my colleagues uh, do an analysis of the video. We use a photograph of a Jennifer Aniston lookalike. We do not, in the video, you'll, you see it, it pops up repeatedly. We uh, never use an actual photograph of Jennifer Aniston. And in fact, there's a, in the credits, there's a little line that says, no actual Jennifer Aniston's were harmed in the making of this video. <laughs> um, and, and I had to make sure before we aired that, that we were legally, you know, safe and sound to do so. And, and one of my colleagues who specializes in intellectual property rights matters did that analysis and said, said, go ahead, throw it up there. So, yeah. Yeah, that because I'm watching it going, man, this has got to be <laughs> walking the tight wire here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it, but it's fun, and I'm, you know, if she has seen it. Do you know if she's seen it? She has to. Well, people, people it. asking, we have no idea. I mean, it, okay. it's, I mean, it's <laughs> like, I hope, I hope she's seen it because it's a, it's a. At the end of the day, it's a sweet, quirky, funny video that comes at the subject of obsession uh from a from a different angle than you might expect when you listen to the song it's a it's a i'm not going to give the video away but you know when you listen to the lyrics of the song it's a it's a guy who's clearly borderline obsessed with jennifer aniston wondering why she won't hang out with him 
But when you see the video, it's I'm not going to give it away. It's something entirely different. And, and I, I think most right. most everyone I know has come away from that video smiling. Yeah, know? no doubt. It's it's definitely a great song and it's a great feel good video for sure. Uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll run that for sure. Thank you. Uh, um, now I noticed on on the debut you have a remix of it that's right. fairly similar in style to since you've been gone and that's uh correct chris yeah. vanderhayden chris, chris vanderhayden who's a friend of uh uh well the second half of the first album was produced by greg cohen who's producing album two in its entirety and this was occasion because uh our musical genius who produced the first half of the record charles zarnecki who was one of the three guys that co-founded the band with me back when we got started charles got married to a woman who was doing a graduate degree in berlin and he took off for germany to be with her so and greg and i have known each other forever uh he's been producing in new york for 30 some odd years and we plugged him in <coughs> and he finished that record and his buddy chris vander hayden's a buddy of greg's over in belgium and chris Greg was running tracks past Chris as we were finishing album two. And Chris said, I'd, I'd love to take a stab at remixing one of these. And, and we were like, pick one and do whatever you want. And so, yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a lot more like the single version of Since You've Been Gone than anything else on that album, except, yeah. as I said, except for the song, except for the song that we pulled okay. off to hold, hold back for album two. Yeah. Cool. But it, it taught, it taught, I'm, I don't, I'm not a producer and it taught me an important lesson, which is that, the same song with the same melody can be produced in any, I mean, you kind of, you know, this when you listen to it. it can be produced in any number of ways, you know, it could be, it could be a classic rock song. It could be more dance oriented. It could be more punk oriented. Yep. And so, yeah, you have these, you have these choices to make when you first start. And on that first album, we maybe weren't, we, we weren't, I don't think we thought as much about the choices we were making in terms of style and genre as we went from song to song. Now we are. Okay. Okay. Um, did he have any hand in since you've been gone? Chris Van Raden? No, no, that's not a hundred percent. Greg Cohen producing both the album ballad version and the more up-tempo poppy single version. Cool. Um, you talked about studio and, and, you know, I know you're not a producer, do you know if the the approach on this was a little bit different in the studio, like the way you record it? Um, no, not really. Um, the 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 underlying tracks were all recorded on the same day that we recorded "Santa Bring My Girlfriend Back." Wow, we did those. We did the two songs in one day, and so the the single version of "Since You've Been Gone" is really it's really a, 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 a remix in a way of the of the album ballad version cool cool now but the, yeah. under, the underlying the underlying parts are this i mean obviously the, the single version has you're hearing things on it that you won't hear you don't know this but that you won't hear on the album ballad version there are synths and you know they're more you know 80s yeah. pop and dance oriented things on there that you won't be on the album version right right um now you've mentioned that there's a few different styles on this record and uh it, <laughs> i don't want to give away too much but a uh, bossa nova tune <laughs> that that's the outlier i mean um uh, i mean if we go back to the first album go back to the debut album the song he reminds me of you which we held back was an outlier because it was just a little too uh different from everything else on there um there's a song, it's close to ready to be mixed, called, it's called, How Did I Write This Song? It's a melody that's been rattling around in my brain for quite some time. And it's one of the songs where I didn't necessarily hear the musical track along with it. I had the lyrics and the melody, but I didn't have an idea in my head for what the rest of the song, what the rest of the music would sound like. So I sang it for Greg in his studio in Manhattan back in September. And he, I said, all right, that's it. What do you think? And he said, he said, I know you're going to think I'm crazy, but I, hear, <laughs> but I hear it as a bossa nova tune. 
And I said, man, I would have never in a million years <laughs> conceived of it as a bossa nova tune, but I, I trust Greg's judgment. That's why he's producing. And I said, let's give it a shot. Let's see if we can make that happen. And so uh, the first thing we had to do was get our two guitarists, John Makem and Mike DeCampo involved to see if either of them could even play in a bossa nova style. And they, they both can, they're brilliant guitarists. And between them, they worked out the basic chords and uh, we had a rough demo. And then what I didn't have, I didn't have a chorus and I didn't, I spent about a month wondering if I could, could I write a chorus for this song that now in the verse form is clearly a bossa nova tune. And one day driving from my Connecticut house into Manhattan to, to hook up with Greg on mixing since you've been gone, the chorus just literally came out of nowhere, popped into my head. I tried not to wreck the car while I sang it into my iPhone. And I got to Greg, I got to Greg's studio. I said, I think this is a bossa nova chorus. And he said, yeah, that'll work. And so we, we went with it. I, I'm re I, I, I can't imagine the song. Not bossa, bossa nova. <laughs> it, it's a, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of bossa nova. I, 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 had the great good fortune of going with 12 of my buddies to Carnival during, uh, you know, to Rio yeah. for Carnival years ago. Uh, the music was everywhere. Um, and you can't not love the great bossa nova tunes, whether yeah. it's, you know, Antonio Carlos Obim's Girl from Ipanema, or even some of the American tunes that are bossa nova influenced, like uh, Burt Bacharach's The Look of Love. Yeah. Um, and so we're hoping, we're hoping we, we can pay homage to those great tunes and i, I think as bossa nova tunes go i think it's pretty damn good yeah, but that's you know, cool. we'll let the world judge that. awesome now is that the first of its kind that you've ever done have you ever done that's, a bossa nova tune no, no I, I told you I, I could have never conceived of it being a bossa nova tune it was greg's idea yeah. uh the our, our the, the our two guitarists just nailed it they did absolutely beautiful work on it and i think people are going to be I think people are going to love it if they ever get a chance to hear it. I don't know that anyone on radio is ever going to play it, but it's, it's a beautiful song. I'd be surprised. I think, you know, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of radio now that's looking for something a little bit different. Uh, well, this, one, this one's going to be a lot different. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Now, you know, you're that, that'll be a lot different since you've been gone. It's different for the band. You say your guitarist, you know, just nailed it did their part changed in style they can you know they're adaptable um what was there any reaction when you bring in you know a bossa nova tune or you know since you've been gone are they like wow this is different uh and then they just nail it or is was there any kind of input on their part anybody from the band well well once greg had the idea i mean the great thing about all the guys we work with whether it's Kyle Cassell, our drummer, Dave Richards, the bass player. Um, none of them are kids. And, you know, so they've played a lot of different styles over the years and they're open to trying anything new and they're, they're gifted. They're all just really gifted. So, um, you know, when we threw, since you've been gone at them, both John Makem and Mike DeCampo on guitar were like, uh, I, you know, sure. I'll give it a shot. Why not? In fact, I think DeCampo said before we sat down with him in Greg's studio to lay down, John worked out some of the first parts and then we sent those to Mike to listen to Mike DeCampo and Mike came in and said, I had to spend about three days listening to Bossa Nova records <laughs> before, <laughs> before I could figure out what, you know, what, what this was all about. Cause I've never really played this stuff, but Mike has spent 40 some odd years as a professional guitar instructor. I mean, he made his living teaching guitar for decades so he can play anything if he puts his mind to it. Right. And the very first time he touched his acoustic and, and started playing, Greg and I just sat back and looked at each other and went, Oh my God, that's gorgeous. <laughs> wow. So yeah. We've been, we've been really, we we're really lucky to have amazingly talented musicians fleshing out these bare bones ideas that Greg and I come up with. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and not everybody can adapt, you know, there's great players that just. Well, but I, I, think, I think, I think great, great musicians grow up. Yeah, they they grow up and they learn. I mean, play the early earliest stuff by Green Day, and then play what they did later. Play the earliest stuff by the Beatles, and then play Rubber Soul. 
they grew up the right. Jonas Brothers. The Jonas Brothers on their most recent record, I can't remember which single it is, but they're using a Bo Diddley beat. I mean, they're they're clearly students of rock history, and they're learning and they're growing up. And it's I had this. We have a a new lawyer in the firm, young kid, and uh, I said to him, I said, I, I said, you know, uh, I said he's cool, right? He's a young kid and he's cool. I said, go listen to Justin Bieber's last record. Go listen to the Jonas Brothers' last record. Guys your age may be dismissing these guys as boy bands because they were when they were teenagers. I said, but they're more now. They're much more now. And you really got to listen to their new stuff. Yeah. See, and that's, uh, yeah, they, they, you, you, I think a lot, of, a lot of artists, bands, put themselves in a position, in a box, and then it's real very hard to get out of that. You know, you there's yeah, a third right. I mean, but that. they're band, but they're bands, they're bands that have, you know, that they've, they've taken that to the bank, whether it's you know, like an AC DC or a KISS or somebody, they're they're not going out, they're never going outside their lane, but it works and they've become, you know, world famous and and they've had great long, long careers. And that's you know, that's the hardest thing to do is to have a career in this business that spans decades. That's rare. That is really rare. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it, that, that particular thing reminds me, I just talked to Reb Beach, a uh, guitar player for Winger, uh, among other bands, White Snake, and, and he's done a lot of things. But with Winger, uh, they got pigeonholed by the Beavis and Butthead thing, where... Yeah. You know, they were picked on. He had a winger shirt and he, the nerdy kid had a winger shirt, uh, you know, and that killed the band. I mean, it really did. It, it really hurt them. They still exist and they're they're a fantastic band, uh, really great musicians. Uh, but it's, you know, they still carry around that. They're the nerdy kid. You know, it's uh, so I, 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 I was a nerdy kid. I'm sympathetic to all the nerds. of the world. <laughs> There you go. Uh, now I've—I think it was on the 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 one sheet, the uh, press release. There's another something similar with a song called "Nuclear Winter." Uh, can you tell me about that one a little? Nuclear Winter is—it's not. You're not gonna. It's not gonna evoke since you've been gone. It's not gonna evoke the Chris Vander Hayden remix of Jennifer Aniston. It's a darker song about dark things. Um, uh, the first line of the song is, uh, I was walking down the street when a Russian missile landed at my feet. Um, wow. And uh, I've had that line in my head for a long time. Uh, and I've, I probably had the first verse of the song, lyrics and melody, and actually on this one, a lot of the music in my head for a long time. But sometimes I carry around just a first verse of a song and that's all I have, sometimes for years. The urban unrest of this past summer, where so many of our cities were uh, the subject of mindless looting and burning, um, triggered the idea in my head that this, this, is, this nuclear winter song is probably something that I should finish. And I, I took some inspiration from the events of last summer and expanded the song to speak to, you know, what would happen if one of these major cities, I chose New York, because that's where I spent my whole adult life, what would happen if one of these cities just got completely destroyed? And so I, I, I finished the song. Um, I didn't have a bridge, uh, but I was sitting in Greg's studio as we were getting ready to, to demo what I did have. And the, the bridge just came out and literally, I don't know, I keep saying this, but it's true. Bridge came out of nowhere. I, I wrote the bridge sitting on his couch in his studio and we recorded it right there. And uh, it's one of those songs that this is one where when the rest of the band heard it, they all went, now that's a really cool song. That, that's different. And it, it, it's, yeah, it's going to be dark and different and speak to sort of apocalyptic themes. But musically, it's, it's interesting. Cool. Yeah. Now that's, I was going to say, that's different for the band as well. Uh, a darker theme you guys are, I mean you write in a very satirical uh, comical fun usually yeah, we've been uh, tongue-in-cheek a little bit tongue-in-cheek tongue in cheek on on tongue-in-cheek on some of the songs I mean the Santa bring my girlfriend back clearly 
is consistent. It, it seems like it flows straight from album one where right. there were uh, a bunch of like Summer Girl on the first album, you know, is, is a tongue in cheek song uh, about a guy chasing the wrong girl who's arguably a hooker. He's chasing her over the course of a couple of summers, you know, stupidly pursuing like a lot of songs. He's pursuing a girl who's wrong for him and who he probably can't get. And um, so, yeah, but uh, you know, we had, we had some straight up uh, non-satirical, non-tongue in cheek songs on that record too. Songs like um, the one that I wrote for my wife, Lydia, Marry Me Again is just a straight up, you know, love song from a, a guy to his wife um, or uh, Saturn's rings, uh, you know, a, a guy who stumbles across a girl who's bemoaning the loss of her love. And he relates to her, his tale about a love that he once lost and how eventually you're going to find love again. So it's not, you know, there's, I'm thinking through what's on album too. There's less of the satirical tongue in cheek approach on album two. This is more an album about love lost, love found, leave aside nuclear winter and its apocalyptic themes. But a lot of the songs are, are like so many songs of, you know, of any era, you know, relationships, you know, relationships, some of them worked and some of them didn't. Yep. That's life, isn't it? <laughs> that, that is life. It that sure is. is. Um, these themes and, and things just, they, they just come to you. It's, it's really, you know, well, I'm no, I'm no, I'm no, I'm no, I'm no genius in, in writing songs about relationships. I mean, that's just, but I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's great that, you know, you don't sit down. I mean, I, I would imagine you do. You sit down to write, but rarely, there's... rarely. Actually, I, it, it, it's funny you say that. I'll tell you about, I didn't sit down to write the Jennifer Aniston song. Never occurred to me I'd write a song about Jennifer Aniston any more than I'd write a song about Santa Claus stealing someone's girlfriend. Those two songs, those two songs came out of nowhere. The Jennifer Aniston song was triggered by walking to and from the path station, the subway station, where I'd go home to my place in Jersey City back when I lived there. So from my midtown office to the path station, back and forth, passing the newsstands, at the point in her life where she was the subject of every tabloid, every other tabloid cover, because she couldn't get that Justin guy to marry her. Right. <laughs> it was like, and, and, and you'd walk by and you'd see that you'd see the tabloid covers and you're sitting there going, what the hell's going on here? You know, she's gorgeous, talented and worth a hundred million dollars or something. And, and she can't get this guy to the altar. Like there's gotta be <laughs> something going on. And I, literally I, I, I was walking into the northern edge of Herald Square by Macy's. And the first lines of that song came into my head and I had to stop in the middle of Herald Square and sing those lines into my iPhone. And then I went down underground and went back to Jersey City and finished the song. <laughs> wow. Having done the Jennifer Aniston song and done the Jennifer Aniston video, there was a part of me that said, and I had this conversation with John Makem, our guitarist, because he John has a, a band and a recording life of his own outside of us and has for a long time, very successful indie guy. And I said, I said, John, I go, I go, I think I got a, what I think I got it. Like this Jennifer Anthony thing is just going to get me in trouble. I'd better write a song for my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and marry me again came out of that thought. And the first, <laughs> lines, the first lines of that song happened as I was driving from my Jersey, Jersey City place to the office in Manhattan. And it hit me just before I went in the mouth of the Lincoln Tunnel. And I think the first lines of that song were recorded on my iPhone in the Lincoln Tunnel. So uh, sometimes I, I, it's rare that I decide I'm going to write a song about something. Marry Me Again came out of that. Um, Since You've Been Gone was, was triggered by an actual breakup long ago. Um, whereas other songs, you know, the, the, I didn't decide to write Ruby run away with me, but all the press when Kenny Rogers passed and this idea that I'd already had that maybe we should revisit some of the girls that other guys sang about was there. So that, that triggered that. I mean, people keep saying, are you going to write about Roxanne? You know, the police is Roxanne. Hey, right. And I, I, I don't, I'd love to, don't have an idea for it yet, but I mean, the, the one that I'd really one that really keeps tugging at me is, uh, are you a Marshall Crenshaw fan? 
Uh, not not big. I know some of the stuff. I, I consider his first album one of the great albums of the 80s. I, I, I could listen to it all day long, his debut album. And on there is a song called Marianne. Okay. And I've always wanted to revisit his Marianne 30 or 40 years later. So cool. I think Marianne comes before Roxanne for me. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to I'll have to go through that album. I don't know, that, listen, I know that album. Listen to just it's Marshall Crenshaw. That's what yeah. it's called. It's one of the great rock modern rock albums of the 80s, in my humble opinion. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I'll I'll definitely hit it. Uh Larry, this is this is awesome, man. Uh do you have a release date for the second album? We're we're an unsigned band, although now with the benefit of uh, distribution through some thanks to some really great people at Universal Music who fell in love with the Santa Bring My Girlfriend Back tune. Uh, and that did well, that did well enough that they're backing us on the release of uh, Since You've Been Gone. They're they're opening some doors that otherwise wouldn't be open to us, probably. Nice. And with any luck, they'll with any luck, I hope we do well enough with this single that they'll want to keep helping us with the rest of the singles um it's it's been tough uh, both partly with covid and partly with the fact that we're we're a band of older guys almost all of whom have wives and kids and and you know other jobs to pay the bills uh, it, it, the scheduling is hard um we have six more songs to do i mean they're in demo form uh but you know it there's no release date because no one tells us you have to put out your record on day X because we're not signed to a label, you know. So right. I'm hoping that over the course of the next three months, we take the last six songs out of demo form. We've been recording songs, usually three songs in a day when we get the full band into the studio. We get put everybody in isolation booths, everybody records together. So we, we don't need a lot of time in the studio to do it, but getting everybody into that one place sometimes takes longer than it should. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, with, with luck, we're out. We're, uh, if I were to predict the way things are going, we might be looking at a third quarter release now. Okay. That's not so bad. That's not so bad. So bad. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. But in the well, meantime, in the meantime, I think we'll keep cranking out singles. So, okay. Yeah. Well, and you got quite a few to, to let I think, out. I think, yeah, my, my guess would be nuclear winner is the next single that's a guess i mean we'll talk to our friends at universal see what they like see see what maybe you know see how since you've been gone does uh, but the next single has got to be either nuclear winner or ruby run away with me so okay. and then after that we could we could you know the next one that's probably you know in the can totally finished ready to go would be the bossa nova tune which i, I, yeah. I can't <laughs> i really want it out there as a single i, I don't know if anybody wants to hear it i want to hear it. yeah push it out there man <laughs> yeah uh that's just awesome man larry it's always great to see you my friend uh let's let's, uh, see you too. Let, let's do it again when uh you know we'll do, we'll do another one when uh you release the next when the single. next single when the next single's out yeah very cool we'll be in touch cool. man. all right thank, thank you for the time man i really appreciate it thank you got you. it anytime man and uh be well go, uh, go listen to that marshall crenshaw record okay it is next up on the queue right here. All right, man. <laughs> All right. Easy, Scott. Thank Take you. it easy. Thanks, Larry. Bye.